PCP design using CAD, computer aided design CAD. Computer aided design CAD is the use of computer programs to create two or three dimensional 2D or 3D graphical representations of physical objects. CAD software may be specialized for specific applications. Advantages of CAD packages Computer aided design is one of the many tools used by engineers and designers and is used in many ways depending on the profession of the user and the type of software in question. CAD is one part of the whole digital product development DPD activity within the product lifecycle management PLM process and as such is used together with other tools which are either integrated modules or standalone products such as Computer Aided Engineering CAE and Finite Element Analysis FEA Computer Aided Manufacturing CAM including instructions to computer numerical control CNC machines photorealistic rendering and motion simulation document management and revision control using product data management PDM CAD is also used for accurate creation of photo simulations that are often required in the preparation of environmental impact reports in which computer-aided designs of intended buildings are superimposed into photographs of existing environments to represent what that locale will be like, where the proposed facilities are allowed to be built. Potential blockage of view corridors and shadow studies are also frequently analyzed through the use of CAD. CAD has been proven to be useful to engineers as well. Using four properties which are history, features, parameterization and high level constraints. The construction history can be used to look back into models personal features and work on the single area rather than the whole model. Parameters and constraints can be used to determine the size, shape and other properties of the different modeling elements. The features in the CAD system can be used for variety of tools for measurement such as tensile strength, yield strength, electrical and electromagnetic properties. Also, its stress, strain, timing and how the element gets affected in certain temperatures, etc. Why CAD is important? Allows us to create a detailed map of a design implementation puts our designs into a common format that others can understand and critique, help us to create a list of pin connections called a net list. Scope of CAD Computer-aided design is the use of computer systems to facilitate creation, modification, analysis and optimization of design. Computer system means combination of hardware and software. Computer-aided manufacturing is the use of computer system to plan, manage and control the operation of a manufacturing plant. CAD is a subset of design process. Engineers involved in the design process are usually themselves the CAD designers who execute the CAD process. CAD process is a geometric model of the product under design. Activities of CAD process includes mass properties, finite element analysis, dimension, tolerance, assembly modeling, generating shaded images, documentation and drafting. CAD process and its tools utilizing three disciplines. These are geometric modeling, computer graphics, design, PCB manufacturing and camp Manufacturing starts from the PCB fabrication data generated by CAD. The Gerber and Exelon files in the fabrication data are never used directly on the manufacturing equipment but always read into the CAM computer aided manufacturing software. CAM performs the following functions input of the Gerber data, verification of the data optimally DFM. Compensation for deviations in the manufacturing process, 
Example, scaling to compensate for distortions during lamination. Panelization. Output of the digital tools, copper patterns, solder resist image, legend images, drill files, automated optical inspection data, electrical test files, etc. Panelization. Panelization is the procedure whereby a number of PCBs are grouped for, a, for manufacturing onto a large board, the panel. Usually, a panel consists of a single design, but sometimes multiple designs are mixed on a single panel. There are two types of panels. Assembly panels, often called arrays, bare board manufacturing panels. Assembly panels, often called arrays. The assemblers often mount components on panels rather than single PCBs because this is efficient. Bare board manufacturing panels. The bare board manufacturers always uses panels, not only for efficiency, but because of the requirements, the plating process. Thus, a manufacturing panel can consist of grouping of individual PCBs or arrays depending on what must be delivered. Depaneling A panel is eventually broken apart into individual PCBs. This is called depaneling. Separating the individual PCBs is frequently aided by drilling or routing perforations along the boundaries of the individual circuits, much like a sheet of postage stamps. Another method which takes less space is to cut out a V-shaped grooves across the full dimension of the panel. The individual PCBs can then be broken apart along this line of weakness. Today, Depaneling is often done by lasers which cut the board with no contact. Laser panelization reduces stress on fragile circuits. Copper patterning The first step is to replicate the pattern in the fabricator's cam system on a protective mask on the copper foil PCB layers. Subsequent etching removes the unwanted copper. Alternatively, a conductive ink can be inkjetted on blank non-conductive board. This technique is also used in the manufacture of hybrid circuits. Silk screen printing uses etch resistant inks to create the protective mask. Photo engraving uses a photo mask and developer to selectively remove a UV sensitive photo resist coating and thus create a photo resist mask. Direct imaging techniques are sometimes used for high resolution requirements. Experiments were made with thermal resist. PCB milling uses a two or three axis mechanical milling system to mill away the copper foil from the substrate. A PCB milling machine, referred to as a PCB prototyper, operates in a similar way to a plotter receiving commands from the host software that control the position of the milling head in the x, y and if relevant z axis. Laser resist ablation spray black paint onto the copper clad laminate place into the CNC plotter. The laser raster scans the PCB and ablates vaporizes the paint where no resist is wanted. Note. Laser copper ablations isn't rarely used and is considered experimental. The method chosen depends on the number of boards to be produced and the required resolution. Large volume Sill screen printing used for PCBs with bigger features. Photo engraving used when finer features are required. Small volume Print onto a transparent film and use a photo mask along the photosensitized boards, that is pre-sensitized boards, and then etch. Alternatively, use a film photo plotter. Laser resist ablation, PCB milling. Hobbyist. Laser printed resist. Laser print onto a toner transfer paper. 
heat transfer with an iron or modified laminator onto bare laminate, soak in water bath, touch up with the marker, then etch. Vinyl film and resist, non-washable marker, some other methods. Labor intensive, only suitable for signal boards. Subtractive, additive and semi-additive process. Subtractive methods remove copper from an entirely copper coated board to leave only the desired copper pattern. In additive methods, the pattern is electropated onto a bare substrate using a complex process. The advantage of additive method is that less material is needed and less waste is produced. In full additive process, the bare laminate is covered with a photosensitive film which is imaged, exposed to light through a mask and then developed which removes the unexposed film. The exposed areas are sensitized in a chemical bath usually containing palladium similar to that used for through hole plating which makes the exposed area capable of bonding metal ions. The laminate is then plated with copper in the sensitized areas. When the mask is stripped, the PCB is finished. Semi-additive is the most common process. The unpatterned board has a thin layer of copper already on it. A reverse mask is then applied. Unlike a subtractive process mask, this mask exposes those parts of the substrate that will eventually become the trace. Additional copper is then plated onto the board in the unmasked areas. Copper may be plated to any desired weight. Tin, lead or other surface platings are then applied. The mask is stripped away and a brief etching step removes the now exposed bare original copper laminate from the board, isolating the individual traces. Some single-sided boards which have plated through holes are made in this way. General Electric made consumer radio sets in the late 1960s using additive boards. The semi-additive process is commonly used for multi-layer boards as it facilitates. Chemical etching Chemical etching is usually done with ammonium persulfate ferric chloride. For PTH, plated through holes, additional steps of electroless disposition are done after the holes are drilled. Then copper is electroplated to build up the thickness. The boards are screened and plated with tin or lead. Tin or lead becomes the resistive leaving the bare copper to be etched away. The simplest method used for small scale production and often by hobbyists is immersion etching in which the board is submerged in the etching solution such as ferric chloride. Compared with methods used for mass production, the etching time is long. Heat and agitation can be applied to the bath to speed the etching rate. In bubble etching, air is passed through the etching bath to agitate the solution and speed up etching. Splash etching uses a motor-driven paddle to splash boards with etchant. The process has become commercially obsolete since it is not as fast as spray etching. In spray etching, the etchant solution is dispersed over the boards by nozzles and recirculated by pumps. Adjustment of nozzle pattern, flow rate, temperature and etching composition gives predictable control of etching rates and high production rates. As more copper is consumed from the boards, the etching becomes saturated and less effective. Different etchings have different capacities for copper, with some as high as 150 grams of copper per liter of solution. In commercial use, etchings can be regenerated to restore the activity and dissolve copper recovered and sold. Small scale etching requires attention to disposal of used etchant, which is corrosive and toxic due to its metal content.
The HN removes copper on all surfaces exposed by the resist. Undercut occurs when HN attacks the thin edge of copper under the resist. This can reduce conductor width and cause open circuits. Careful control of edge time is required to prevent undercut. Where metallic plating is used as a resist, it can overhang, which can cause short circuits between adjacent traces when closely spaced. Overhang can be removed by wire brushing the board after etching. Inner Layer Automated Optical Inspection AOI The inner layers are given a complete machine inspection before lamination because afterwards mistakes cannot be corrected. The automatic optical inspection system scans the board and compares it with the digital image generated from the original design data. Lamination Multi-layer printed circuit boards have traced layers inside the board. This is achieved by laminating a stack of materials in a press by applying pressure and heat for a period. This results in an inseparable one-piece product. For example, a four-layer PCB can be fabricated by starting from a two-sided copper-clad laminate, etch the circuitry on both sides, then laminate to the top and bottom, pre-preg and copper foil. It is then drilled, plated and etched again to get traces on top and bottom layers. Drilling Holes through a PCB are typically drilled with a small diameter drill bits made of solid coated tungsten carbide. Coated tungsten carbide is recommended since many board materials are very abrasive and drilling must be high RPM and high feed to be cost effective. Drill bits must also remain sharp so as not to mar or tear the traces. Drilling with high-speed steel is simply not feasible since the drill bits will dull quickly and thus tear the copper and ruin the boards. The drilling is performed by automated drilling machines with placement controlled by a drill tape or drill file. These computer-generated files are also called numerically controlled drill NCT files or Exelon files. The drill file describes the location and the size of each drilled hole. Holes may be conductive by electroplating or inserting metal eyelets hollow to electrically and thermally connect board layers. Some conductive holes are intended for insertion of through hole component leads. Others typically smaller and used to connect board layers are called wires. It is also possible with controlled depth drilling, laser drilling or pre-drilling the individual sheets of the PCB before lamination to produce holes that connect only some of the copper layers rather than passing through the entire board. These holes are called blind wires when they connect an internal copper layer to an outer layer or buried wires when they connect two or more internal copper layers and no outer layers. Plating and Coating PCBs are plated with solder, tin or gold over nickel as a resist for etching away the unneeded underlying copper. After PCBs are etched and then rinsed with water, the solder mask is applied and then any exposed copper is coated with solder, nickel or gold or some other anti-corrosion coating. Matte solder is usually fused to provide a better bonding surface or stripped to bare copper. Treatments such as benzimidazolithiol prevent such oxidation of bare copper. The places to which components will be mounted are typically plated because untreated bare copper oxidizes quickly and therefore is not readily solderable. Traditionally, any exposed copper was coated with solder by hot air solder leveling, HASL. The HASL finish prevents oxidation from underlying copper, thereby guaranteeing a solderable surface. This solder was a tin lead alloy.
However, new solder components are now used to achieve compliance with ROHS directive in the EU and US, which restricts the use of lead. One of these lead-free components is SN100CL, made up of 99.3% of tin, 0.7% copper, 0.05% nickel, and a nominal of 60 ppm germanium. It is important to use solder compatible with both the PCB and the parts used. An example is ball grid array BGA using thin lead solder balls for connections, losing the balls on bare copper traces or using fine free solder paste. Other platings used are OSP, organic surface protectant, immersion silver IAG, immersion tin, Electroless nickel with immersion gold coating ENIG, electroless nickel electroless palladium immersion gold ENEPIG, and direct gold plating over nickel. Edge connectors placed along one edge of some boards are often nickel plated than gold plated. Another coating consideration is rapid diffusion of coating metal into tin solder. Tin forms intermetallic such as Cu5SN6 and Ag3Cu that dissolve into the tin liquids or solidus at 50 degrees Celsius, stripping surface coating or leaving voids. Electrochemical migration ECM, is the growth of conductive metal filaments on or in a printed circuit board under the influence of DC voltage bias. Silver, zinc and aluminum are known to grow viscous under the influence of an electric field. Silver also grows conducting surface parts in the presence of halide and other ions, making it a poor choice for electronic use. Tin will grow viscous due to tension in the plated surface. Tin, lead or solder plating also grows viscous only reduced by the first stage tin replaced. Reflow to melt solder or tin plate to relieve surface stress lowers viscous incidence. Another coating issue is tin pest, the transformation of tin to a powdery allotrope at low temperature. Solder resist application Areas that should not be soldered may be covered with solder resist solder mask. One of the most common solder resists used today is called LPI, Liquid Photo Imageable Solder Mask. A photosensitive coating is applied to the surface of the PWB, then exposed to light through the solder mask image film and finally developed where the unexposed areas are washed away. Dry film solder mask is similar to the dry film used to image the PWB for plating or etching. After being laminated to the PWB surface, it is imaged and developed as LPI. Once common but no longer commonly used because of its low accuracy and resolution is to screen print epoxy ink. Solder resist also provides protection from the environment. Legend Printing A legend is often printed on one or both sides of the PCB. It contains the component designators, switch settings, test points and other indications helpful in assembling, testing and servicing the circuit board. There are three methods to print the legend. Silk screen printing epoxy ink was the established method. It was so common that legend is often misnamed silk or silk screen. Liquid photo imaging is a more accurate method than screen printing. Inkjet printing is a new but increasingly used. Inkjet can print variable data such as text or barcode with a serial number. Bare board test. Unpopulated boards are usually bare board tested for shorts and opens. A short is a connection between two points that should not be connected. 
An open is a missing connection between points that should be connected. For high volume production, a fixture or rigid needle adapter is used to make contact with copper lands on the board. Building the adapter is a significant fixed cost and is only economical for high volume or high value production. For small or medium volume production, flying probe testers are used where test probes are moved over the board by an XY drive to make contact with copper lands. The CAM system instructs the electrical tester to apply a voltage to each contact point as required and to check that this voltage appears on the appropriate contact points and only on these. Assembly In assembly, the bare board is populated with electronic components to form a functional printed circuit assembly, PCA, sometimes called a printed circuit board assembly, PCBA. In through-hole technology component, leads are inserted in holes. In surface mount technology, SMT, the components are glued on pads or lands on the surface of the PCB. In both components, leads are then mechanically fixed or electrically connected to the board by soldering. There are a variety of soldering techniques used to attach components to the PCB. High volume production is usually done with SMT placement machine and bulk wave soldering or reflow ovens. But skilled technicians are able to solder very tiny parts, for instance, 0201 packages, which are 0.02 inch by 0.01 inch, by hand under a microscope using tweezers and a fine tip soldering iron for small volume prototypes. Some parts may be extremely difficult to solder by hand, such as BGA packages. Often, through hole and surface mount constructions must be combined in a single assembly because some required components are available only in surface mount packages, while others are available only in through hole packages. Another reason to use both methods is that through hole mounting can provide needed strength for components likely to endure physical stress while components that are expected to go untouched will take a less space using surface mount techniques. For further comparison, see the SMT page. After the board has been populated, it may be tested in a variety of ways. While the power is off, Visual Inspection, Automated Optical Inspection, JEDEC Guidelines for PCB Component Placement and Soldering and Inspection are commonly used to maintain quality control in this stage of PCB manufacturing. While the power is off, Analog Signature Analysis, Power of Testing. While the power is on, in circuit test where physical measurements for example, voltage can be done. While the power is on, functional tests just checking if the PCB does what it had been designed to do. To facilitate these tests, PCBs may be designed with extra pads to make temporary connections. Sometimes these pads must be isolated with resistors. The in circuit test may also exercise boundary scan test features of some components. In-circuit test systems may also be used to program non-volatile memory components on the board. In boundary scan testing, test circuits integrated into various ICs on the board form temporary connections between the PCB traces to the test that the ICs are mounted correctly. Boundary scan testing requires that all the ICs to be tested, use a standard test configuration procedure, the most common one being the Joint Test Action Group JTAG standard. The JTAG test architecture provides a means to test interconnects between integrated circuits on a board without using physical test probes. 
JTAG tool vendors provide various types of stimulus and sophisticated algorithms not only to detect the failing nets but also to isolate the faults to specific nets, devices and pins. When the boards fail the test, technicians may desolder and replace failed components as tasks known as rework. PCBs intended for extreme environments often have a conformal coating which is applied by dipping or spraying after the components have been soldered. The coat prevents corrosion and leakage current or shorting due to condensation. The earliest conformal coats were wax. Modern conformal coats are usually dips of dilute solution of silicon rubber, polyurethane, acrylic or epoxy. Another technique for applying a conformal coating is for plastic to be sputtered onto the PCB in a vacuum chamber. The chief disadvantage of conformal coatings is that servicing of the board is rendered extremely difficult. Many assembled PCBs are static sensitive and therefore must be placed in anti-static bags during transport. When handling these boards, the user must be grounded earth. Improper handling techniques might transmit an accumulated static charge through the board, damaging or destroying components. Even bare boards are sometimes static sensitive. Tracers have become so fine that it's quite possible to blow an edge off the board or change its characteristics with a static charge. This is especially true on non-traditional PCBs such as MCMs, and microwave PCBs. Design flow of CAD. This section illustrates the basic procedure for generating a schematic in capture and converting the schematic to a board design in layout. The basic procedure is as follows. Start capture and set up a PCB project using the PC board wizard. Make a circuit schematic using CAD capture. Use capture to generate a layout net list and save it as a .mnl file for layout. Start layout and select a PCB technology template .tch file. Save the layout as a .max project file. Using layout to import the .mnl file netlist into the .max file. Make a board outline. Position the parts within the board outline. Auto route the board. Run the post processor to generate files used to manufacture the PCB. Starting a new project. Before you make a PCB layout, you need to have a circuit to lay out to the board. You will use capture to make the schematic. So the first step is to start the capture application by clicking the demo. Once capture is running, you should have a blank capture session frame and a session log. Go to the file drop down menu and navigate to file, new and click project. Type a name for your project and then select the PC board wizard radio button. If you feel comfortable selecting your own location to save the project, you can do that or you can use the default location for now. Just remember where it is as you will need to find it later on with the layout. Click OK. After you click OK, the PCB project wizard dialog box shown in figure will pop up. For now, circuit simulation will not be performed. So leave the enable project simulation box unchecked. We will take a look at circuit simulation. Click next. After you click next, the PCB project wizard dialog box shown in figure will pop up. The box allows you to add specific libraries to your project. Scroll down until you find the discrete library highlighted by clicking on it and then click the add button. Then click finish. This completes the project setup. You should have a project manager window in the left side of the capture session frame 
as shown in figure. You may also have a schematic window in the workspace. If the schematic is not open, expand the project name .dsn directory by clicking the box that is to the left of the project name .dsn icon. Where project name is the name you gave your project while using the project setup wizard. Click the box next to the schematics folder. Then double click the file called page 1. The schematic page should open. If you do not see the dots, that means your grid is turned off. The grid must be turned on to properly place and connect the parts. To turn the grid on, click the button. If the grid is on, the grid dots will be visible and the grid button will be grey instead of red. Placing Parts To add parts to your schematic, make the schematic page active and select the place from the part drop down menu or press the place part tool button or press P on your keyboard. The place part dialog box shown in figure pops up. In the library selection box in the button left of the dialog box, click discrete. Then in the part list box, click C for capacitor. You should see its symbols in the preview window on the lower right. Click OK. In the libraries window, you may have libraries different from what is shown in figure. At the very least, you should have the discrete library since you had the wizard include in it. If for some reason you do not see any parts or the discrete library is not there, you can follow along for now to get an overview of the process or you can find and add the library to your project. To add a part library to your project, select place from the drop down menu as described above. In the place part dialog box shown in figure, press the add library button to bring up the browser file dialog box shown in figure. Find and select the discrete.olb library and click open. You can also find a capacitor in the pspice library folder. To add it, double click the pspice folder, select the analog.olb library and click open. You should now be back to the place part dialog box and the library you just added should be shown in the library's list box. Find and select C from the part list selection box and click OK. After you click OK, you should immediately return to the schematic page and have a capacitor tagging along with your mouse pointer. Left click on the schematic page to place a part as shown in figure. Place a couple of capacitors on the page. When you are finished, hit the escape key or right click the mouse and select end mode from the wiring connecting the parts. Next, connect the parts with wire. To place wires, hit the W key or select place wire from the place drop down menu or press the place wire tool button. The cursor will turn into a crosshair. Place the cursor on a box at the end of one of the capacitor's leads and left click to start a wire. Click on the end of another capacitor lead to complete the wire. The crosshair will persist so you can continue placing the wires. Finish connecting the wires to the capacitors however you wish. Once you have finished connecting the circuit, press the escape key or right click and select end wire to stop the place wire cursor and get the pointer back. If you inadvertently click near a lead but not on it, the wire may appear to be connected but may not be. That is why it is important to have the grid enabled. If the connections are not made properly, you will have problems when attempting to generate a netlist. You will be able to tell if a connection you made to a component was completely proper 
because the box at the end of the lead will disappear. At this point, do not worry about power supplies or ground connection. This is just a big picture exercise to demonstrate the design flow process. Creating the layout net list in Capture. Once all the connections are complete, the next step is to create a net list, an ASCII text file that describes the circuit. There are several types of net lists, but you will want to generate a layout net list. Begin by making the project manager window active instead of the schematic page window and select the .dsn icon by left clicking it once. If the schematic page is active, the tools menu will not be available. Minimize the schematic page if necessary to get to the project manager. Select Tools, Create Netlist from the Tools menu. The Create Netlist dialog box will pop up from the Create Netlist dialog box. Select the Layout tab. Later, you will see how to set up file structures to organize your projects. But for now, just save it to the current default directory and remember where the netlist file with the .mnl extension is saved. Click Finish to generate the netlist. Capture will display a warning text box stating design path slash your name dot dsn will be saved prior to netlisting. Click OK. Capture will then generate the netlist and report the results in the session log. At this point, you have generated a netlist file with a .mnl extension that layout can use. You could close capture now, but leave it open so that capture and layout can communicate with each other if necessary. This will allow you to go back and review the circuit if you need to when you are working in layout. PCB design using CAD. Designing the PCB with layout. Starting layout and importing the netlist. Now you will use the netlist to route a board using layout. Begin by clicking the Windows Start button on your taskbar and navigate to all programs, then ORCAD 10.5 demo, layout demo. Once layout is up and running, you will be presented with the blank session frame initially. To begin working on your board, you will need to tell layout what kind of board you want to use and then import the netlist file you generated with capture into the board type. Begin by selecting the new from the session frames file menu and auto eco automatic engineering change order. There are three pieces of information that need to be entered into the auto eco dialog box. You will add the first two pieces of information in the TCH and the MNL text boxes and layout will enter a default value into the third max text box. The first step is to select a board technology template, a star.tch file. Click the browser button across from the TCH text box and navigate to the tools or layout or data folder. Layout should go there automatically and select the default technology template default.tch. The wizard will type the path and the name of the technology file into the text box for you. Once the technology file is assigned, you need to select the layout netlist that is .mnl file you generated in Capture. To do so, Click the browse button across from the MNL text box and locate the .mnl file you created in Capture. You probably will not see it at first since you will likely be in the data folder from which you selected the technology file. Navigate to where you save the project. Once you find your file, select it and click open. The wizard will type the for now, click OK once you have selected a footprint. Layout will assign this footprint to all of the capacitors in the design by default. 
If you added other components in addition to the capacitors, you will probably have to repeat this procedure for each type of component. Right now, it is not important what the footprint is because we just want to get an overview of the overall process. Notice that on the window taskbar that there are two layout applications. The initial one is the layout session frame and the other is the design window that was just open. To get a better view of what you are trying to work on, you may want to zoom in or zoom out or move the viewing area up, down, left or right. To zoom out, place the cursor at the location you would like the center of view to be and then hit the letter O on the keyboard. To zoom in, place the cursor at the location you would like the center of view to be and hit the letter I on the keyboard. To recenter the view without zooming in or zoom out, place your cursor at the desired center and hit the letter C on the keyboard. Shows some of the other viewing features you can use from the view drop down menu. If you ever get to a view that you cannot get out of, and want to get back to the layout workspace, select the design option from the view drop down menu. You can also hit the zoom all button or hit shift home on the keyboard to see the whole board. Making a board outline It is a good practice to place the board's lower left corner at the origin. If you have not already done so, zoom out so that you can see the entire drill table and have it located near the bottom of the window. Next, make sure that the online design rule check DRC box is off. If you do not see it, it is already off, but if you see a dashed or solid white box in the workspace, the DRC box is on. To turn off the DRC box, click the button. There is another DRC button that looks like, but it is for checking the entire design for errors prior to sending the design out for fabrication. The online DRC checks the area within the box while you work. Sometimes it can get in the way of doing what you need to do while you are moving things around. So turn it off for now. To make a board outline, click on the obstacle button it looks like. Move your cursor to the work area and right click the mouse. Click the new option from the pop-up menu. The crosshair cursor will be smaller now, indicating that it is poised to do something. Right-click on the work area again and select the properties option from the pop-up menu. The edit obstacle dialog box will pop up as shown and make sure that board outline is selected in the obstacle type drop-down list and that global ladder is selected in the obstacle layout drop down list click ok create a board outline similar to the one shown figure place the cursor over the origin mark in the drill charts upper left corner position one click and release the left mouse button once this begins the first vertex of the board outline next move the cursor to position two the border will stretch from the last place you click to the cursor. At position 2, left click and release again. Continue in the same manner to positions 3 and 4. After you have placed the final vertex at position 4, right click to bring up a menu box and click finish to complete the board outline. The board outline does not have to be rectangular, but for now, it will help keep things simple. Auto routing the board. To route the board automatically, pull down the auto menu down as shown in Find Select Auto, Auto Route Board. Layout will automatically choose the best parts and layers to route the entire board. Once routing is finished, an information dialog box pops up telling you so. Click OK. Depending on how you placed your parts, layout may have used layers different from those shown in figure. In the demo version of layout, there are four default layers that are enabled. 
top, inner 1, inner 2 and bottom. Altogether, there are 16 routing layers that you can enable and control. You will learn how to control the different layers manual routing. The first two tools use some of the auto routing features to assist you when you are manually routing traces. The last two are strictly manual tools and allow direct control of the routing process. You can try the tools out now to see what they do. Do not worry about messing up the board. If things get out of hand, you can always start over by unrouting the board from the auto menu. You can manually unroute or rip up a trace by selecting a trace by holding down the shift or control key on the keyboard while left clicking on the trace. The trace will become highlighted. Right click and select one of the unrouting options from the pop up menu. You can also do an automated cleanup as discussed below. Cleanup To perform a cleanup, go to Auto Cleanup Design as shown in figure. Next, check the items you want cleaned up using the Cleanup Design dialog box. Cleanup checks for routing problems such as off grid or acute angles, bad pad exits, and overlapping wires. If you have certain traces that you do not want altered during a cleanup or any other action, you can lock the traces so that they are protected. Locking Traces To lock a trace, activate one of the manual routing tools, either the Edit Segment Mode or Add or Edit Route Mode, and then select the trace by holding the Control button and left clicking the trace. Then right click and select lock from the pop-up menu or press L on the keyboard. Performing a design rule check, after you have completed routing and cleaning up your board, you should check for errors. To check for errors, run the project DRC by pressing the button. This DRC is different from the online DRC. The online DRC checks for errors as you go and checks only whatever it is you are doing at the moment. The project DRC checks the entire board for errors. Post-processing the board design for manufacturing. At this stage, layout has generated a design file that fully describes your board. This file is optimized for viewing, editing and saving on your computer, but it is not in the format that many PCB manufacturers use for fabricating boards. The most common type of file system used in PCB manufacturing is the Gerber file system. Layout has the capability of translating its .max file structure to a Gerber file system. This is called post-processing the design. Normally, you would post-process the design from its existing location, but for this example, it will be much easier to see which file the post processor generates if you copy the .max to an empty folder. So, save the current .max design into a new folder all by itself. To do so, select Save As from the File drop-down menu. Click the Create New Folder button in the Save As dialog box and enter a name for the folder. Hit enter and then double click on the new folder to navigate into it. Click the save button. The next step is to set up the post processor. Select post process settings from the options menu. A post process spreadsheet will pop up. You can use the spreadsheet to enable specific layers and define the Gerber file format. To modify a layer settings, left click once on the layer in the spreadsheet. To select it and then right click on it and choose properties from the pop-up menu or double click the layer name. From the post process settings dialog box, you can edit the desired properties. The most important thing to do is to make sure that the enable for post processing box is checked for the layers you use to route the board. If you leave this box unchecked, a Gerber file will not be generated for the layer. When you are finished setting up the post processor, click OK to complete the setup process for this example. 
To start the post processor, select Auto Run Post Processor. Layout translates its .max file into separate Gerber files for each layer that you enable. Once post processing is completed, a dialog box pops up telling you one return to through hole dot tap. Click OK again. Finally, a text file automatically opens up in Notepad. Example name dot list. This is the post processor report which tells you what layers were generated and some information about them. At the bottom, look for the words no warnings or errors, which means that the process has complete properly. Now look at the folder in which you have saved the copied.max file. 